Hey everybody, it's Mark Patterson back again with might be the most exceptional podcast I'm going to do this year. I'm so excited about this. And so for anybody that's just tuning in, I really, really encourage you to just sit back, you pinch yourself that you're going to actually listen to this guy. I drove two and a half hours to come up to Santa Inez, California, which is about 20 miles or so north of Santa Barbara. And I am with Charles Plum, otherwise known as the captain. So the captain, how are you doing? Mark, great being with you. I'm doing great. Oh my gosh. I got a, your wife asked me, so how did I hear about you? And I got to drop this in really quick. So I was in the Northwest. I was in Seattle a couple weeks ago as the Huskies were playing UCLA. And there's an old buddy, Dave Mater, who came up to me and a fraternity buddy, guy who I grew up with. And he's been listening to these podcasts that I've had out there. And so he came up and he goes, hey, I've been listening to these podcasts and I'm telling you, there's this one guy that you have to interview. Somehow or another, you have to make this happen. I'm like, well, tell me more. And he goes, is you need to talk to Charles Plum. And I said, who's Charles Plum, right? Right. And so he went through this whole thing about, you know, some of your history. He works for Windermere Real Estate. He owns okay. an office. Sure. So apparently you've been up and you spoke with, you know, their corporate or something. So he was just going on and on. And so I quickly retreated back to Southern California after the game and I typed in your name and I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got to have this guy on the podcast, right? And so I reached out and I was so thankful. And so I just want to start with that, you know, seriously amount of grateful that you've come on this thing and your story is so amazing. And again, I also thank Dave Mater for mentioning your name. So thank you. Well, thank you. And thank Dave uh, on my behalf. You know, it's always nice to have a fan. Well, yeah, I think you've got a, a bunch of fans. Okay. So your story is so intriguing and so fascinating. And one of the things that we're going to get into, my dad, who passed away, unfortunately, five, six years ago, was a Air Force pilot uh-huh. and flew missions all over the world. You became a Top Gun pilot, and we'll get into that in a minute. You know, so he used to tell us stories at the dinner table about flying into Beirut and Afghanistan and all these other places and flying these different supplies. And so, you know, it's just, I wish my dad was here today to be in this conversation because you guys would absolutely hit it off. I suspect he's looking down on us and listening to every word. Yep, yep. To his pilot buddies, who was known as Buddy Patterson. So I'm okay. sure Buddy is, is actually uh, <laughs> looking down on us. So again, so many stories. Where did the whole, you wanted to go become a pilot, where did that start? Well, it actually started in high school. Well, let's back up a little bit. Grade school. I grew up in a tiny little town in Kansas and used to see these Piper Cubs fly over. And I remember thinking, wouldn't it be nice to ride in an airplane? And then my immediately next thought was, no, I'll probably never be able to ride in an airplane. Well, at age 17, I needed an education and my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. So I started looking for scholarships. I got an appointment to Annapolis, which is a big surprise to me. And so I got on that Greyhound bus and two days later, I was pledging to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, just like your dad did. But I had no idea what a difficulty it would be to fulfill that commitment, you know, over the years. But so four years at the Naval Academy, and it was time to choose which direction we wanted to go in the Navy. So wait, wait, wait. Okay. If we can go back to this one step. Sure. So I was recruited when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. I was a decent football player, so I was being recruited by a number of different colleges, and the Air Force Academy came after me. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that I had to get an appointment. I think from the congressman of the district or the governor or something to make that happen. That's right. Is that the way that played? Oh, yes, it is. Now, the congressman from Kansas in my district did it a little differently from most. A lot of them, are, it's a political appointment. You know, whoever their donors are and whoever their best friends are, they take their sons and now daughters and appoint them. In my case, it was a competitive thing, and we all took a test, and then my congressman sent uh, five nominees to the Naval Academy. The Naval Academy picked three of the five. I was actually the second alternate. And so (laughs) the number one guy went to the Air Force Academy, as a matter of fact, and the number two guy discovered women. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so he's out. Yeah, he's out. Yeah. <laughs> he's no good for the Navy. No. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so then I was the second alternate and got the nod. That's how I got into the Naval Academy. Was, you know, you look back on your life. I'm sure you do too, Matt, about the things, the little decision points in your life that could have gone either way. And it just changed the whole rest of your career. Well, certainly it sounds like it did for you. Yep. Do you think, and I'm asking this question because in high school for me, and I'm getting into the mental part of all this, okay? And so in high school for me, I didn't really have to work that hard at my craft, which is playing football. Mm -hmm. I just was more of a natural athlete. And I didn't really understand and figure that out until I got to the University of Washington and played under my, would become a legendary head coach, Don James, Mm -hmm. about discipline, about Mm -hmm. working for things. Mm -hmm. So going to you, 
right? So now you go through these four years in the Naval Academy. Is that where you feel like you learned, like where your mental toughness came from? Is that where you cut your teeth? Good question. And you're right. I had sort of a similar path. I could sort of breeze through high school. I certainly wasn't an athlete or even a great student, but I didn't try very hard. But it was only when I got to the Naval Academy that I realized that, man, if you're going to be effective, you know, if you're going to have a career, if you're going to have a life, you know, you're going to have to get disciplined and you're going to have to knuckle down and do some things. And so you're right. It was a great awakening for me to go to an And I'd never had any military discipline. My father was kind of a tough dad, and so I had his discipline. My mother taught me a lot about forgiveness, which I needed. Well, I got that one right (laughs) sitting next to me, so I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I love those mothers. Uh, And we can talk a little bit more about that, you know, in my POW years, because forgiveness, I think, is one of the reasons that I came out of there as whole and as healthy as I did. So discipline from my dad and forgiveness from my mother and then the Naval Academy sort of melded all those things together because the military discipline that I'd never seen before, you know, to stand up straight, you know, about face, uh, wear your uniform, cut your hair, shine your shoes, all these things that were foreign to me. And, you know, just like plan for you, Dub, must have been for you. <laughs> and you kind of find from coaches like that, that if you really are going to achieve, you're going to have to get serious about it. And so that's where I got serious about it. Yeah, for me, it was an absolute shock to my system. Yep. I mean, I showed yep. up the first day of fall camp, two days, right? And I hadn't done anything more than I did in the past and, you know, do some water skiing and catch a few balls. And I looked out there and I was so far in over my head, right? <laughs> yeah. And so at that point, it's the moment of truth, right? It is. And it's a life's about choices and what kind of choice do you want to make? Yep. Right? Do you want to be yep. one of those guys that, you know, is one of the guys that plays and, and contributes, or do you want to be the other guys that just wash out? Yep. Right? That's right. Okay. So you go through four years of that, and mm-hmm. then as you come out, what are your choices? Can you exit, or can you go for further education? Well, there are several choices, but you do have a commitment, you know, to the military. You yep. have to stay in. And so you can either stay in with Navy line. That means you're going to be aboard ship, and that's what most of the Naval Academy graduates do. You can go Marine Corps. We had about 10% of our guys go to the Marine There's no Marine Corps Academy per se. And so they get their graduates, their academy graduates are actually Naval Academy graduates. Yep. And so we had about 100 guys go Marine Corps. You can go submarines. You can go supply corps. You can go on to school, you know, get a master's degree in something, or you can go fly. And by that time, I had had a couple of introductory flights in the Navy that really thrilled me. And so I thought, man, this is really reaching for the moon. But if I can get into flight training, that's what I'll do. So I was fortunate enough from the Naval Academy to be, again, about 10% of the graduates in my class went uh, down to Pensacola for aviation training. And so, you know, I picked up on that and did, you know, fairly well in flying. 18 months of that, learned to fly on aircraft carriers, which, of course, is a trick unto itself. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> you got to land on like 50 yards of surface, right? I mean, That's I'm right. sure it's more than that, but it's pretty intense. No, it's, well, the total length of an aircraft carrier is about 1,000 feet, but yeah. the landing area is about 300 feet. Yeah. Yeah, so football about field. football field. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm landing on a football field, and of course, you've got four wires stretched across that football field. The hook, your tail hook, catches the wire yeah. and slows you to a stop if you're lucky. <laughs> and if you're not so lucky, you add power and you pop back in the sky and you try it around one more time. Yeah, yeah. If you've still got some gas. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Tricky, I yeah, tricky, that tricky. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't have. But so that's an interesting life, uh, 18 months of that. And at that point, then another, you know, big milestone in my life in selecting the type of airplane I was going to fly. Because the Navy, you know, like your dad, I had an option of flying uh, cargo or patrol or communications or fighters. And so I wanted to fly fighters. So at the end of flight training, I applied for and got orders to the F-4 Phantom replacement air group in Miramar, California, San Diego. And wait, and what year was this? I graduated in 64, so this would have been in 66. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it came out here. Of course, flight training was in several bases, Pensacola, Florida, Beeville, Texas, Meridian, Mississippi, and I got my wings of gold and then uh, came out to San Diego, where I helped start the Top Gun School at that time. How do you do that? So they had an idea that they wanted to create an elite group of pilots, right? It all stemmed from the Vietnam War. We had built airplanes for the Cold War. And our airplanes, and the one I flew, the F-4 Phantom, didn't have any guns on it. And in fact, didn't have any kind of short-range weapons at all. 
we had missiles to go out 20 miles where you couldn't even see your target. And I wore a space suit to fly because I was going above 50,000 feet to launch off the aircraft carriers, go out for four or 500 miles, shoot down the Russian bombers and make a slow turn and come back to the aircraft carrier. That was my mission. There was nothing about dogfighting, nothing about, you know, hassling with other airplanes because at the time in the Cold War, we thought we'd never see another World War II dogfight. So it was kind of interesting. Again, it was almost by accident. Accident, it was assigned to the F-4. There was a pool of students to be learning to fly the F-4. And there wasn't enough airplanes around, so I had a six-month wait in flying the F-4 Phantom. Well, my buddy Paul Krukey and I were a little impatient to fly airplanes, and so we went down the flight line at Miramar and found these old F-9 Cougars. Well, this is a Korean War airplane that we had trained in in our flight training. They were using it as an instrument training airplane, and so we knew how to fly this airplane. So we signed on with this instrument squadron. And it was really very boring because you're teaching kids to fly in the soup. And so it's a straight and level, you know, boring holes in the sky. Well, we'd save a little gas each day and we'd lurk off the coast of San Diego and we would attack the F-4s as they were coming off of the line. <laughs> and of course, they didn't know how to fight. You know, that wasn't trained. They weren't trained to be a dogfighter. We would attack these guys and just wipe them out every time. We were light and we were quick and we were small and they were big and they were heavy and they were fast. But if we'd get them just as they got their wheels up, <laughs> we would wipe them out. So, so when you say wipe them out, that's like Yeah, we'd shoot them down. Right? Yeah, we'd simulate shooting yeah. them down. Get on their tail. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And that's what no fighter pilots want you to get on their tail because that's the shooting position. So I'm thinking of the movie Top Gun, yep. right? Where yep. Tom Cruise and Goose and those guys are going up there and they have all these dog fights as they're yep. practicing. And yep. they, of course, they're not shooting, actually shooting them down. They just put them in their sights. They right. hit the button, red, red, beep, 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 beep. And theoretically, yep. they've shot them down. That's exactly what we were doing. Yeah. Well, so we came back from a very successful mission one day, Paul and I, and we were giving ourselves high fives and, you know, wearing our Snoopy goggles and our white scarves and <laughs> in the ready room in this instrument training squadron had big letters, Plum and Crookie, report to the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron immediately. Oh, we knew we were in trouble. So here's two kids. We were 23 or 24 years old, okay, and <laughs> with sweaty flight suits, and we're knocking on the door of the commanding officer of the F-4 squadron, you know, the big airplanes, the fancy ones. I'll never forget this guy. He's sitting there at his desk, and he's looking over the top of his glasses, and he was in a sweaty flight suit, too, which should have been our first indication <laughs> of what happened. He said, you the two guys out there in the F-9s? Oh, yes, sir, we were. Did you follow an F-4 through an entire loop? Uh, y y yes, sir, we did. Did you have your guns trained on that F-4 the entire time? Mm, yes, sir. Do you know who was in that F-4? Oh, <laughs> it was probably him, right? <laughs> Yeah, we thought we were toast. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I just came back from Vietnam. You guys look an awful lot like Migs over there. And it was true that this airplane we were flying, the F-9 Cougar, was about the size and shape of a MiG airplane, which was the main airplane we were fighting against in Vietnam. He said, our kill ratio is terrible because we don't know how to fight this airplane. He said, do you want to come back tomorrow and do the same thing? And that's how Top Gun got started. Wow. It was just, a, you know, a couple of snotty-nosed kids, you know, out there playing games and found out that, yeah, uh, there was a reason. And it was very successful. Top Gun turned the whole kill ratio around because there was a way to fight these big airplanes. It was just that we didn't know how. So it was all in the training. That is awesome. So how many other guys did they bring into that program? Oh, over the years, several hundred. But it's not quite like the movie. Top Gun, well, first of all, there was never any best Top Gun. You know, you didn't get a prize like you saw in the movie. But what it was, was each squadron in the Navy, and there are, oh, I don't know, probably 50 fighter squadrons in the Navy, would send one or two guys to the school as sort of train the trainer. And so the two guys or gals now would go through Top Gun, and of course they still do it today. And then they would go back to their squadrons and train everybody else what they had learned at the Navy Fighter Weapons School. Got it. Got so, it. I, saw, I did see a picture with you and Tom Skerritt. I think that's how you write. Yeah, the yeah. The the you know, you, you mentioned Windermere, and uh, I did. I was in Seattle speaking to Windermere, I don't know, two or three months ago. It's a real estate company up there. And I was surprised that Tom Skerritt, who was Jester yeah. in the movie, which was the role that I played, the adversarial role. You know, he was the bad guy, and that's what I did. You know, I was the enemy, and uh, he introduced me, as a matter of 
effect. Oh, is that the right? Yeah, it was really, really cool. Oh, that's, and of course, they fun. showed clips from Top Gun, and then I show up in my flight suit. and then it was, yeah. oh, That's a way to roll you out right there. Yeah, and that's probably why Dave remembers that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, yeah, I mean, like I said, a, a must listen. Okay, so you graduate, so to speak, from this Top Gun school that you essentially helped create. And then when did you get drafted into the Vietnam War? Well, I joined the squadron right just six months after I went through the replacement air group in Miramar. And so that would have been in mid-1966. And so I joined the squadron, and they were between deployments. The way it works is they'll bring an aircraft carrier back for about six months, and we train and train, and then we get back on the aircraft carrier, go back to war. And so I joined the squadron in about... And probably three fourths of the pilots in the squadron had already been to Vietnam, but now they were going back. And so I was joining them because they had several casualties. So I was a replacement pilot. Did that scare you? No, I was never afraid. You know, if I was afraid, I wasn't smart enough to realize I was afraid. Yeah. I was excited about doing that. You know, I mean, I was flying the hottest airplane in the world. You know, I'm thinking this, there's not one-tenth of one percent of anybody in the world can do what I'm doing. And I just felt so proud. You know, and of course, the patriotic thing, too. You know, I'm fighting for freedom. I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting for a way of life. And, of course... The fact that I felt like I was bulletproof and felt like I'd never get shot down. That's part of the being youth thing, right? Yep. It's the whole maverick, you know, yep. bravado. And, That's right. Yeah, and your inner superior aircraft. And, and in reality, and when I look back on it, you know, I think I don't think we could have done what we did thinking that we were going to be shot down. Yeah. I think the only way you can go into combat is to believe that you're going to survive. Now, you hear different stories about guys having a death wish or that kind of thing. But for me, I just didn't think they had a gun big enough to shoot down Charlie Plum. Yeah, you know, this is slightly different. It is different. But, you know, when you're playing in the NFL, uh, yep. Major League, the minute that you lose your confidence, you're mm -hmm. done. This conversation came up the other day about receivers out there, and I've seen it one after the other where guys just get clocked. Yeah. You're done. And so the same thing with you, right? Yeah. It's yeah. just that supreme confidence that you're talking yeah. about to enable you to, to survive and get through and know that you're going to win, mm -hmm. even though you don't know the outcome. And I think it's life itself, you know? I mean, I think lots of times we go into situations, and if you think you're going to lose, it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, so now you take off on, I think, the U.S. Kitty Hawk, Kitty Hawk. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And off you go. Yep. And you fly 74 missions. Right. And what did that entail? Well, usually there were two missions a day, and we would fly four weeks at a time. And so you go four straight weeks on the line, just working every day. And the mission itself would be an hour and a half or two hours long. Now, there was a, a two-hour brief and an, an hour to two-hour debrief and all of that. So you add all that up, and you got about a 10-hour day. Mm -hmm. but that's only one of your jobs. Every Navy pilot has collateral duty. And so I also was in, in charge of a maintenance crew, and we were repairing uh, d battle damage airplanes and airplanes that had problems, and that was. And so I had to spend time with my crew as well. So it's a pretty busy life, pretty hectic like life on aircraft carriers. And, and when you went off on these missions, you would go in and you were bombing or providing support or all the above. The F-4 Phantom, designed, as I've mentioned, as a high-altitude supersonic interceptor, was uh, outfitted with racks so that we could drop bombs and rockets. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't supposed to, you know, the plane wasn't designed to do that. But they felt that that's what they needed in an airplane, and that's what we became. So of the four-week crews, we would spend two weeks as fighters and then two weeks as attack. So for two weeks, we'd uh, take off with air-to-air -air missiles to protect the strike group. And then two weeks, we would take off with bombs. We would be the strike group. We would be the air-to-ground bombs and rockets. Mm. And so our missions were supporting troops. You know, we would go in and fly close to the Army and Marine Corps on the ground. They would shoot up a flare, a smoke signal, and say, hey, you know, the enemy is just, you know, two clicks to the north of the smoke. And we would go in. Most of the time, we could never see what we were hitting because we were too high. We were releasing at 5,000 feet. And we'd pull out at about 2,500 feet. So most of the time, but the fact that forward air control would always tell us, you know, how close we were and what we did. And they were always very, very happy to see us come because lots of times, these guys were pinned down, and the enemy was just all around them. And so we were their savior. And a lot of guys, as a matter of fact, since that time, you know, tell me how thankful they were when they saw the F-4 Phantoms come in. I can only imagine, you know, I've had buddies, I've not been to Vietnam myself, but I've had buddies in Vietnam. And one of the things that they do over there now is they take you on tours of all these underground. It's just like a whole city, you know, mm -hmm. down below, mm -hmm. and these tight little tunnels that 
can barely crawl in. The people are just, you know, in those days, were just coming out left and right, and you have no idea where those entry and exit holes were. It was really a tough war. Tough war. Yeah. So now let's talk about your 75th mission. Okay. 75th mission. It was called an Alpha Strike, and it was a big deal. And everybody wanted to be on an Alpha Strike. It was sanctioned by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so it was straight from the Pentagon. And it it gave us targets that were very important targets. Lots of our targets weren't very important. You know, know, we were hitting little bridges that would be rebuilt the next day or little supply lines that we never knew how effective we were. But an Alpha Strike was the place to be. So I felt pretty fortunate fortunate to be on this strike. Now, this was the first two weeks, so I was an uh, air-to-air defense. Okay, I was carrying missiles to shoot down other airplanes that didn't have any bombs, and so, but I was protecting the bomb group. So I was on the far left side of this big armada of airplanes. A surface-to-air missile picked me up and came right at my tail, blew up to some 12,000 pounds of jet fuel I had on board in my co-pilot, and I came tumbling out of the sky. I ejected, he ejected, our parachutes opened in 90 seconds. I went from king of the skies, top gun fighter pilot to prisoner of war. So tell me what you're going through, what's in your mind when you get hit and now you're floating from the sky down to earth in these Vietnam jungles. You know, I just remember being uh, totally almost out of body. How can this be happening to me? You know, I'm thinking this has got to be a dream because I can never be shot down. You know, I can never go through this. Um, and then my next thought was, how do I get out of this? You know, I mean, you, you know, in one of your podcasts, you talk, how did I get here? And what am I going to do about it? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and that was what was going through my mind. How did I get here? And what am I going to do about it? And the how did I get here? That faded away really quickly when they started shooting at me. And they're shooting from the ground, small arms rifles and pistols. I'm hearing these bullets crack past my ears. And so I'm kind of jigging around in this parachute, wondering if I'm going to be alive for the next millisecond. So then I started looking around for some way out of this. You know, I'm trying to memorize everything I see. I was above a rice paddy, but there were tree lines on the side of the rice paddy, and there was a little village there, and I'm looking at this place. And then I decided, no, the best thing I can do right now is just bow my head and say a prayer. And that's what I did. Took a deep breath, let about half of it out, bowed my head, and asked for a little extra strength that day from above. So you did not get hit. I didn't get hit, no. And what about your co-pilot? He didn't get hit either, but he got burned fairly severely. I got a little burned from this explosion of all this jet fuel. But he got some pretty bad burns on his back. But he survived. You know, he was going to get through it. So now you come to Earth and you're on the ground and you're in this, obviously, in the enemy territory. How soon was it before they picked you up? Immediately. You know, they were shooting at me, so they saw exactly where I was coming down, and within seconds, they were on top of me. I actually landed in the water and the mud of a rice paddy, about waist deep in a rice paddy, and they just waited out in the rice paddy, and it's mostly farmers at first, machetes and rakes and shovels and pickaxes and that kind of thing. They were coming after me. So I had a 38 revolver with me and a bandolier of shells, but there were too many of them. There was no way that I was ever going to shoot my way out of this. And so I gave up, and they captured me and stripped me of everything I had. They took my flight gear, my clothing, my personal possessions, and eventually they even took my name and gave me a name from their language to humiliate me for the next six years. Okay, wow. So when they landed on you, you're in this rice paddy, all these guys are coming around you. Did they beat you? Were they like, you know? Yeah, they were very angry. And so they beat me. And th- when the militia finally showed up with their bayonets and their guns, why they started poking me with their bayonets. So I ended up with four open wounds when I got to the prison camp, just from the beatings. And where was this prison camp? It was in downtown Hanoi. It was the, what we later named the Hanoi Hilton. Yeah. Their name was Wallo, which meant uh, fiery furnace. And the French had built this camp for the Vietnamese in the 1850s. They had in their big war with the Vietnamese. And so it was an old, old prison camp uh, built primarily for smaller people than us. And everything was smaller. You know, the ceilings were smaller. The manacles that we wore, the handcuffs were not big enough for our wrists. And the shackles on our ankles were smaller for smaller people. But they were using on us anyway. And so that's another, something else was tearing into my skin was the shackles and the manacles. So you're in this prison camp for six years, which was 2,103 days. Right. Right? Yep. Were you shackled every single day? No. 
Oh, no. It was primarily from the beginning, uh, first few weeks, and then whenever they would come up with a purge, you know, they would come up with some reason to punish us, and they'd put you in shackles for another few days. Now, I was one of the lucky ones. I was very junior when I was shot down. I was lieutenant junior grade. The more senior guys had it a lot tougher. And several of our guys, uh, Jeremiah Denton was one of the POWs there, and he was in solitary confinement for four and a half years. And in about two of those years, he was shackled to his board bed. I was going to ask you about that in terms of solitary confinement, or were you generally with a group Most of the time, I had a roommate or two or three. Again, I was one of the lucky ones. I was only in solitary for a few weeks or maybe a month or two, on and off. Were they torturing you guys quite a bit? Yep. And they're trying to suck information? Yep. They started torturing everybody. Everybody who was shot down for the first five years of that war got tortured, which is something that to this day the Vietnamese deny. I went back to Vietnam two years ago, I'll tell you about that as well, and found that none of their population would admit that Americans were ever tortured there. And they didn't call it torture, they called it punishment. So if we didn't tell them, you know, military secrets, then they punished us because we wouldn't tell them the secrets. So they punished us until you told them something. So were you making most of that stuff up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I didn't know any military secrets. I was so junior that right. they didn't tell me secrets. So it was probably wise. So I started making things up. So it was one of the things that we all did, as a matter of fact, to start to lie to them. And we found out that it worked, that they would take our lies away. And they seemed, in that culture, you know, they're so proud. And we would lie to them. And after they found out we had lied, they were embarrassed to accept the fact that we'd pulled the wool over their eyes, you know, that we'd tricked them. And they wouldn't admit that we'd tricked them. And so they didn't come back with any retaliation. Mm. That's great. Kind of weird, yeah. Well, it was. So how do you survive six years of this? Because you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. That's true, and that was probably the worst part. Now, I'd been through four different survival schools in the military, and they teach you to be a prisoner of war. You know, they tell you the techniques that you're supposed to use. And so all four of these schools, however, assumed that we were going to be in a compound situation like the World War II, Hogan's Heroes kind of prison right. camp where you've got... Everybody's in there. Yeah, you're all fenced in and you get out and you play uh, volleyball and baseball and that kind of stuff right. during the day and then you go back and your barracks at night. It was none of that. It was all jail cells. It was individual jail cells. And so you never saw anybody else outside your cell and you were not supposed to communicate with anybody else. Even if you had a roommate, you were supposed to whisper so that nobody else could hear you. And so we were separated. And that was really a big problem because you don't have that support group. But the solution to the problem, of course, was our communication system. And well, even before I got there, they had come up with a code where they would tap on walls and certain taps for certain letters of the alphabet or abbreviations. And so we communicated that way. Is that what is known? I read this. I didn't know what this meant. Underground communicator? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what that is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Underground communicator. And that's one of the things that I did and was appointed to perfect this method of transferring information from one cell to the next and then one cell block to the next and one camp to the next. I mean, it was just really amazing how creative we got with our codes. And to the point where about a year before I was released, about year number five or maybe early year number six, I was there. They moved us all to a new camp and they had built this camp specifically so that we couldn't communicate with anybody else. So it all had double walls and vent holes that didn't look into any other cell. And within about a day and a half, 200 guys knew the name, rank, serial number of the other 199 guys in that camp. I mean, we were just that good at codes. And any noise that we ever heard or could make, we would make a code out of them. For instance, if you got outside to chop wood for a fire, you'd chop in this code of numbers representing letters. And chop, 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 chop. Each one of those two numbers would mean a letter. And so you had a radio station. You know, the whole camp could hear you chopping. And so it was a thing of beauty. We'd write notes on pieces of toilet paper, which is really about the only thing we had. We never had, a you know, a piece of paper or a pencil. And we'd make ink out of brick dust or ashes with a quill pen made out of bamboo, just, you know, it was sort of sanded down to a wedge. And we would write a note and wrap it around a rock and heave that rock from one building to another. We call that airmail. 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> One code, I think my favorite code was when we found out that the enemy all had tuberculosis and they were always coughing and spitting and they assumed that we did the same thing that was natural. And we just found out that we could cough and spit, but we couldn't talk. We decided we'll make a code out of this. So we designated various letters of the alphabet or abbreviations to be represented by combinations of cough, sneezes, spits, or wheezes. So you'd wake up in the morning and hear the guys next door go... <laughs> <laughs> that means good morning. How are you? <laughs> you know, the human spirit was alive and well. You know, it really was. But you see, that's one of the reasons that we came back in such good health mentally and physically. And today, the doctors and the psychiatrists tell us that we're healthier mentally and physically than if we hadn't been shot down. Pretty amazing that 30.6% of all Vietnam combatants have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. Pretty amazing when you consider that, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, what could be more stressful, you know, than six years in a prison camp. And yet, we came back healthier if we hadn't been there. And the reason, I think the psychiatrists and psychologists, people that know more about this than I do, they think is because of the communication and the leadership and the unity that we had over there. The leaders were just, I mean, they were amazing how they redefined our whole purpose and said, hey, we are not victims of circumstance beyond our control. You know, we are not on the defensive here. We are on the offensive. We are fighter pilots. We are combatants. We will pursue this war until our last breath. So pull up your big boy pants. Let's get on with it. That was the attitude of our leadership. Well, what that did was it just unified everybody around this purpose. It just, you know, it was amazing how we needed a positive purpose. And what that did for us was it brought us all together. But the communication was a vital part of that because had we not been able to communicate with each other in those camps, I don't think half of us would have survived. Yeah, my mom and I, who's sitting to my left here, down from Seattle. Happy Thanksgiving, Mom. We were talking about another subject, but it dealt around the whole subject of community, right? And this is essentially what you're talking about. Exactly right. Yeah. Of course, in the military, you know, you've got a pretty tight community to bring in with, you know, and specifically in particular branches of the military, you know, if it, and the Marines, of course, are very close. Submariners are really a tight knit group and aviators as well. So we we're all pilots. And so we all had this mental attitude, this genre of a swashbuckling, swaggering pilot. <laughs> and, and, and so in order to keep that, in order to keep that community going, that support group was established by the communications. And, you know, once you could communicate with another guy and tell him not just positive things that were going on, but the negative things as well. One of the rules of the camp, you know, that Americans came up with, and uh, this is primarily Jim Stockdale, came up with the ways that you need to respond when you're a prisoner of war. You know, this is the way to act. And one of the things was called get on the wall. Okay, what that meant was that when you went to a torture session and they beat the living daylights out of you, when you get back to your cell, get on the wall and communicate what happened. And what that did, of course, was it allowed everybody else to kind of know, hey, what questions did they ask? What answers seemed to appease them? You know, how did you get out of it? And at the same time, it was therapy for the guy that had just been tortured yeah. to find a support group. And so he absolutely worked in spades. You know, community was vital. How did you become the, I'm not sure if you're the only one or one of them, the chaplain? Yeah, there were several chaplains. And I was just one, the particular group that I was in. And I was appointed there. At the Naval Academy, I had been a, a part of an organization called the Officers Christian Union. And this is an organization within the Navy to train lay leaders to conduct services aboard ships where real chaplains weren't available. And so it's largely a structure and the methods of a church service. And of course, I was not an aircraft carrier, so we... In fact, we had several chaplains on the aircraft carrier, but the smaller ships didn't have chaplains of their own. And so guys that had been through this training, you would organize a church service. And so once I got into the prison camp, I knew how to do this. And so I was appointed chaplain of my unit. So every Sunday morning and every uh, Wednesday evening, we would have a church service. Of course, we had to hide from the Vietnamese to do this because they would not allow us any kind of 
religion at all. Communism was their religion, and that's what they wanted us to, to believe in. It was almost surprising, somewhat even disgusting, how they seemed to copy things from the Christian religion to apply to their communism. And in fact, an interpreter told me one time that they thought that Jesus Christ was actually a communist. You know, person of the people, everybody was equal, and, you know, wearing sandals around, and, you know, communistic way. So, of course, you know, I mean, we going to resist all of that, and I found, and the other guys did too, that faith was sort of the baseline of the value system that we needed. And when everything else is gone, you know, our fancy airplane and our fancy uniforms and our families and everything else is gone, what you start to look to are those things that you used to think were sort of ethereal, you know, this sort of pie in the sky stuff becomes very real to you when everything else is gone. And that's what we found. We found that our religion was very important in keeping our sanity and keeping a positive nature and keeping the hope and faith alive that there was a master plan to all of this and there would be meaning and there would be value in it. Well, talk about having your your faith completely tested, Mm -hmm. right, all the way to the end. That's true. You know, and people ask me, you know, I mean, did you find religion in the prison camp? No, I didn't find it. But I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, I validated it. You know, I found out that, yeah, prayer really works, you know, and that so much of the Bible that I had memorized, you know, I'm trying out these Bible verses and I'm thinking, well, is that really true? And not to get religious with you, but uh, Romans 8, 28 says, all things happen for good to those that love the Lord. And so I'm thinking, you mean even in a prison camp, something can happen for good and all I have to do is love the Lord? And so it became kind of a puzzle, you know, kind of a, a challenge for me to think. You know, let's see if this Bible verse really works. Yeah. And so, you know, rather than defining religion, I think I kind of validated it. Well, obviously, you didn't have a lot of distractions. The yeah, well, you know, that's true. Hanging, that, that, and, you know, the family's <laughs> yeah, not, you know, yeah. calling you to, to go to the soccer game. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, you have a lot of time to really think and meditate and really, you know, think about deep things affecting your life and, you know, what is the meaning of life. That's right. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, I kind of miss that sometimes. I'm a mountain biker. I know you're a mountain climber, but I just I'm do it. I'm a mountain bike, too. Do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got some trails and, you know, I mean, I don't do the, the real heavy stuff, but I go on a single track and get a nice bike. And about, oh, two or three days a week, whenever I can do it, I, I'll go and ride uh, 10 or 15 miles in the mountains. And I do it alone. I've tried biking with other guys, but I like the solitude of it all. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of those days when I was in a prison camp where you do reflect. I think everybody needs a few minutes every day just to think about life, you know? Why am I here? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, look, the name of this podcast is Finding Your Summit, yep. right? It's all about overcoming adversity, and certainly you've had your share in finding your way in life, right? And when I was going through my junk, you know, five, six years ago, I retreated to the mountains. Mm-hmm. And on these long expeditions, you know, you're tethered usually about 50 feet from each other, and it's hours and hours and hours of solitude, yep. right? Yeah. Team environment, but... You got a lot of time to think yep. and a lot yep. of time to think about life and, and what's real. It certainly helped me get through a lot of things. So I totally appreciate what you're saying. You know, if you try to count the number of inputs that we all have in our daily life, you know, the sounds and the feels and the smells and the sights and the language and everything's bombarding us, you know, particularly in this electronic age in a prison camp or, you know, on a climb. You know, when you're tethered 20 feet away, you really, you don't have that many inputs. You don't have that many People, you know, yelling at you or radios or TVs or anything going on. Yeah, 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 exactly. Noise. Yeah. Yep. So let's move to your exit. So you've okay. been, you, now you've been in this prison six years, you know, 2,000 plus days. And how do you receive the news? How does that all happen? We'd been tricked several times. And the enemy would come in and say, hey, the war's over. You're going home. Oh, yay. All you have to do is sign this confession that you bombed schools and uh, hospitals. And then we'll let you go. And oh, by the way, here's a clause that you use chemical weapons on, on us too. You know, and, and it was all a sham. They didn't intend to ever release us. So... We we got a little bit callous whenever they told us, we, you know, we're going home. Sure. I mean, that's what you thought about all the time is, you know, when am I getting out of here? You know, when am I going to find out? How am I going to react? And you thought about going home so much of the time so that when war finally ended, you know, we were a little skeptical to believe it. One group of guys thinking that every time the food improved, when they were trying to fatten us up, we're going to go home. We call those the gastronomers. <laughs> yeah. so, but food did improve. And we basically survived on two bowls of rice a day and about 
two or three months before we came home, they came in with some canned fish, some like canned tuna. And they let us outside, you know, to put a little color in our face. They knew something was coming. We thought something was up. But it wasn't until they came in and they laid a sheet of toilet paper. You know, this is the old European kind of wrapping paper we use for toilet paper. And they said, okay, put your foot on this. And they traced around our foot. Well, of course, we hadn't had shoes, you know, for six years. Yeah. And they're going to measure us to make some shoes. And they did. And so, but that was the first indication that they came in and measured our feet for shoes. Wow. <laughs> and of course, about that same time was the Christmas bombing of 1972. And they turned the B-52s loose on Hanoi. And it was amazing. You know, the guards really never paid much attention to little airplanes. But the B-52s, these guys were dropping, you know, 100,000 pounds of bombs at one run. And it just tore them up. And it actually forced them to the peace table. Hmm. And so, even though a lot of these bombs came fairly close to our prison camps, we were just really overjoyed that something was happening. And so, sure enough, the camp commander came in, this guy we call the rat, and he wasn't angry as he always was, and he didn't have a guard behind him with an AK-47 ready to mow us down. And he tried to smile, as a matter of fact, said, today's the day you're going home. And so we said, no, thank you very much, but we're not going home until all the sick, injured, and enlisted men have left this camp. Yep. And see, that was one of our rules as well as prisoners of war. And this is something that we talked about a lot, was what order are we going home in? And the leadership came up, you know, with this order that we will be released. First of all, second injured. Second of all, enlisted men. And then officers by shoot down date, not by date of rank, but the shoot down date. So the guys who were there the longest were going to go home the first. And so we demanded to see the list of the first plane load of guys. Well, at the same time, Kissinger who was orchestrating all of this, apparently got really upset because he was trying any way he possibly could to get us out of there. And now we were refusing to go home. Right. And so he was pretty upset with our little tactic as well. But we finally hammered that out and we found out that, yeah, this is for real. And so we have the authority to go. And so we got on a, a big C-141 cargo jet. 90 minutes later, I was in... Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, being set free. <laughs> Just overjoyed, right? Absolutely. I mean, it was pretty bright and shiny. Oh, my gosh. I'm sure you guys must have gone out and, you know, had a great time and had a big meal. Well, and- you would think. They were pretty skeptical about who we might be after that kind of an experience. Mm. First of all, they thought we might all be brainwashed. Yep. And secondly, they thought, well, if they're not brainwashed, they're probably suicidal. And, of course, a lot of us received some very troubling news when we touched down at Clark Air Force Base, finding out that our wives of six or seven or eight and a half years had filed for divorce. And that happened to me. And so they were very reluctant to release us at first. They thought we probably couldn't eat normal food. So believe it or not, they had a lot of baby food, mostly mashed up rice for us to eat. <laughs> and so all we wanted was a big greasy cheeseburger. Yeah. Fries. <laughs> and fries and a chocolate malt. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> so it was two days there. Clark, and they had really rolled out the red carpet for us there. They had tailors, they had military tailors that sized us up for uniforms because we couldn't wear our regular uniform. We were so skinny, you know, when we came out of there. But they made these uniforms for us just while we were there in the two days. And I'll never forget the hospital we were in, the Clark Air Force Base, was just plastered wall to wall with letters and pictures and drawings from school kids that welcomed us home. And as I recall, there were like four or five story hospital just Every wing of just wall-to-wall letters and pictures. And I found a bunch of them to me personally. So we asked if, you know, a couple of us asked if we could go to the local school and tell them thanks. And so that was the first civilians I really saw was the school kids. And went out and talked to the school kids, said thanks for remembering us. Yeah, no, that is an incredible story. There's another quote that you have that I want to ask you about, because there's a great story behind it. Okay. Okay. And that's all about who packs your parachute. All right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it, it really is an interesting story and sort of surprising. Several years, I mean, several years after I came home in a restaurant in Kansas City, where I used to live, and a fellow kept looking at me and I caught his eye, but I didn't recognize this guy. He came over to our table and he looked at me with kind of a stern look on his face. And he said, you're Captain Plum. I said, yes, sir, I'm Captain Plum. And he started giving me my bio. You flew jet fighters in Vietnam, part of that Top Gun outfit. 
shot down off the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You know, a whole list of me knew me very well. He said, you parachuted into enemy hands and you spent six years as a prisoner of war. Well, I looked up, you know, just befuddled. And I said, how did you know all that? And he said, because I packed your parachute. Well, I was dumbfounded, you know. I mean, um, I I couldn't speak. I staggered to my feet and reached out a very grateful hand of thanks. And, well, he came up with just the proper words. He grabbed my hand and he pumped my arm and he said, I guess it worked. <laughs> so I said, yes, sir. Indeed it did. And I've said, Saved your life. He did. And I said, I've said a lot of prayers of thanks for your nimble fingers, but I had no idea I'd ever had the opportunity of expressing my gratitude in person. Well, a tradition at the time in the Navy is that if you use a parachute, you go back to the rigger, the guy who packs it. It's called a parachute rigger. And you buy him a bottle of booze. And so I bought him the obligatory bottle of booze that night. And we sat there and got sort of philosophical about the whole thing, because, of course, I'm just showering him with praise because he saved my life. Yeah. And he said, you know, I'm probably not the only parachute packer in your life. said, you know, you look back to your parents and, you know, your dad that taught you discipline and your mom that taught you forgiveness and the coach that told you that you could do anything you set your mind to do. And, and he said, those people, they said, he said, I just packed your physical parachute. Now, those people packed your mental parachute and your spiritual parachute, you know, your psychological parachute. They're the ones that really prepared you for that challenge in your life. And so that's the metaphor that I came away with was that who packs your parachute and how's your parachute packed? And sort of that sort of leads right into finding your summit, you know, because you need a lot of help and nobody makes it alone. And so... Well, my dad used to always say, you know, it takes a village. Yeah. And that's essentially yeah. what you're saying, exactly. right? There's multiple people yeah. in that village, right? My coach, my mom, my dad, my sister, my friends, yeah. right? Yeah. My, my football coaches, all those things, you know, all build towards what you ultimately become. Yep. And that certainly helped out in your case. And I also read something, and I don't know if this is true or not true, but there was something in there that I think you came full circle on that back in the day when you were just hot shot Maverick pilot, right? It's like, hey, I'm a jet fighter and you're just a sailor. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So separating those yeah. two things out and as yeah. you, you know, full circle in life of coming to really understanding and becoming grateful about that we're all equal and we all have our place in life. Good point. And it was true that as a jet fighter pilot, I thought those 5,000 men aboard that aircraft carrier were all in support of me, that I was the reason that they had their job. And so I felt a little embarrassed when I finally met this guy that packed my parachute because, you know, I thought, how many times might I have passed him in the passageway of that ship and never said, good morning, how are you? You know, how's it going? Because, you know, he was just a lowly sailor and not a Top Gun fighter pilot. And so that night I told him, you know, I'm just really, really sorry that I didn't have a relationship with you because you're the guy that saved my life. And of all the people that I should respect and admire, you know, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, I think that's true with life. And I try to live my life now, you know, recognizing that everybody has a purpose in life. It may not be my purpose and it may not be things that I even agree with, but everybody has purpose and an option. And I think we need to respect that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'm going to ask you a question on All that right. here in a few okay. minutes. Okay. Was John McCain in that camp? With he you was, there? as a matter of fact. John was my flight instructor. He taught me to fly jets, as a matter of fact, so I knew John McCain. In fact, I had gone to school with his brother, Joe. Joe McCain was in my company at the Naval Academy, so I knew Joe really well. And I'd served under their father, the Admiral McCain. Wow. So. John was shot down five months after I was, and I was the first guy to see him in the prison camp and recognize him, know that he was there. And uh, he was really torn up. You see, he had seven broken bones when he was shot down. Hmm. And they were twisting his broken bones to torture the poor guy. And when they found out that he was the son of an admiral, it really went bad on him. Yeah. But he's really one of the toughest guys I think we had in that prison camp. Unbelievable how strong he was, always in their face. He was just always causing trouble. And most of us, you know, were trying to stay out of the limelight. You know, I mean, prison camp, you don't want them to know your name. <laughs> but he was always causing trouble. Yeah, he sure seems like he's a guy, whether you agree or disagree, a guy with a very strong moral compass. He has know? a very strong moral compass. And while I don't agree with some of his politics, I really respect him for being his own man. Yeah. You know, and he does. And how do you feel in terms of your enemy, which once was? Have you been able to forgive that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, as I mentioned, my mother taught me a lot about forgiveness and even more than just a religious point of view, you know, even more than Christian forgiveness, I found in the prison camps that forgiveness is a survival technique. And it was 
I don't know, maybe three or four months into that situation, I'm just boiling over with hate, just a heart full of vitriol and acid. I established communication with this guy, and and we started passing patriotic quotes and Bible verses and songs and things like that just for something to do. And one of the quotes that he passed me was really meaningful, and the quote is, acid does more harm in the vessel it's stored than on the subject it's poured. Mm. And you know, to me, that meant that, hey, I keep all this acid within me. I'm angry at the enemy, and it's not doing the enemy any harm. You know, it's doing me harm. I'm eating myself alive. I got to learn to forgive this. And so within the first three, four months, I had forgiven the enemy. That's great. That's great. As we all know, you can't fly high with negativity on your back. That's right? a very good point. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. write that one to kind of quote you on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And, you know, so there was another woman that I did a pod with a number of months ago. Her name is Kathy Eldon. Okay. And she's got this crazy story, and she's just a dear soul and bright light. And her son was stoned to death in Somalia. Mm. He was working for Reuters. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the U.S. had dropped some bombs. And, you know, he just happened to be standing there and they were pissed and they came around and they stoned mm-hmm. him. And so it'd be years later that she understood this concept called bless and release. Right? Bless and release. I bless like and it. release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So the yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah, she yeah. knew she couldn't yeah. become all she could be yeah. without really, you know, I setting like that. that free. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so it was interesting, you know, and it's great that you haven't held on to that because you certainly would be a different person today if you were just this angry guy, right? It really is true. And here's an interesting thing is that most, in fact, all of my buddies, the guys I was in a prison camp with, the POWs, have that same attitude. And I go to the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. I have a client out there that I visit every month. So I'm I'm in the, the D.C. area yep. once a month, and I always go by the Vietnam Wall. And I find veterans that show up that were not prisoners of war, and they're still so angry about it. And even World War II, you know, some of the World War II guys are still angry against the Japanese, and they want me to be. You know, they want me to be angry against my enemy, you know, my old enemy, my captor. And it just can't be. I, I don't have that attitude. You know, to me, that's self-defeating, that kind of bitterness. Yeah. I, I'm all about going to the light, and the light is in front, not behind Yeah, object, absolutely. Right? So yeah. how do you feel, and I'm asking this question, and any answer is great, as a former NFL player, mm-hmm. and I'm watching a lot of these guys out there kneeling, mm-hmm. you know, you're obviously dedicated to this country, you mm-hmm. know, war hero. How do you feel about that? Well, I guess I have mixed emotions. First of all, I felt like I was in uniform to defend their right to dissent. Yeah. You know, I was in uniform to protect the First Amendment, and that is my true belief. On the other hand, it just really disappoints me because I feel like they're not achieving anything by this, you know? In, in a way, it's just so counterproductive for them to try to make a point by by degrading the national anthem or flag or anything else that's all American. And, you know, I just feel like that there's so many other ways to get their point across besides getting political and and anti-American with their action. Yeah. I've been asked that question quite a bit. I'm sure you have. Yeah. So that's not my choice. That's not what I would do. And I've got mixed emotions about it too. I'm also not African American. And so I don't know what that's like to be, to live in that plight. But I do think there's other ways to protest. And I wish they would make those choices. But what are you going to do? So it's ongoing. I'm not sure how it's all going to play out. Uh, You know, it really is interesting to watch because I don't think they're achieving any goals by what they're doing. You know, just it's not very logical for me to turn, you know, fairly large group of rednecks, you know, (laughs) against yeah. them, <laughs> and I shouldn't use that term redneck because I'm a redneck, yeah. but sternly patriotic people, like most veterans, as a matter of fact, most veterans that I talk to really think that it's a bad idea, yeah. you know, for them to take a knee. I can understand that anthem. too. You yeah. guys protected our country. Right? Well, we feel that way, and it's kind of a slap in the face of a veteran to be doing what they're doing. Now, you know, and I understand their argument that, hey, no, we're not slapping a veteran in the face. You know, we're not anti-American in doing what we're doing. You know, we have a platform. We're trying to make a point. Okay, well, I understand that, but well, by the way, what you're actually doing, you know, maybe it's the unintended consequence of what you're doing, but oh, by the way, it is a consequence of what you're doing is you're turning an awful lot of Americans off of the NFL and your plight and your position and even your color. And so I think there's a backlash to that and that they haven't considered. Yeah, I don't know. What I do know is that we're doing this podcast and, you know, the bless and release whole whole concept. And so if that's their choice, that's their choice. And yep. I'm going to move to light and talk about, you know, good things. To Absolutely. Come. And yep. I love my country, by the way. 
Yeah, I see the and I, and, and I see I, the flag on your sleeve oh, there. Right, absolutely, yeah, right, absolutely. <laughs> Navy SEAL Foundation. Is I, I see that, and it's yeah. a great foundation too. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. So you're the author of "I'm No Hero," mm-hmm. and you're out on the public speaking circuit. What else do you do? Fly airplanes. I still fly two little airplanes, an antique World War II airplane and an experimental airplane. So I spend as much time as I can with my kids. I have four kids and three grandchildren. Awesome. I'm cashing in a few frequent flyer miles and <laughs> taking 28 people to Hawaii for my birthday party. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, next week <laughs> we'll be in Hawaii. Oh, what a great experience. Yeah, yeah, it really will be. So, you know, I spend a lot of my time on the road. I still speak, I guess I'll speak seven times this month or eight all across the country, all around the world. And so um, that seems to never end. The interest in my story and the philosophy behind the resilience that I have uh, just seems to appeal to a lot of people, you know, in business and in, in personal life. Well, it certainly appeals to me. It's going to appeal to my audience. And I think we're in, in one sense, we're very like-minded in many ways. And I really appreciate your journey. To me, you're a complete American war hero. I'm honored and, and uh, blessed to be in your presence and that you do agree to be on this podcast. Well, thank you for that. And I uh, will throw that bouquet right back at you. You know, anybody that's been in NFL and, and I always wanted to be an athlete, but I just never, well, I shouldn't say that I, it didn't happen. Okay. Uh, I was not brought up in an athletic home. My father was not an athlete. And so I, I never picked up on that like I would love to have done. I have a lot of friends and I still follow a lot of college football. A lot of friends, uh, Roger Staubach is a good buddy of mine, sure. a Navy guy and, and a lot of the Navy. Uh, so I love the sport. You know, I get a football out and throw it around once in a while. Well, I'm but your I, guy, right? I got right, to come up here right. and bring my mountain bike uh, yeah. and bring my football. Yeah, so absolutely. I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> so again, from your hangar here in Santa Inez, I've got my mother, my dear mother next to me. I'm very blessed that she is here with me. And for you, the captain, again, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And anybody has any questions on anything, I'm very open and, and honest and try to be as transparent as I can. I answer all my emails, charliepun.com is my website. Yep. We're going to have that in the show notes afterwards okay. on a lot of detail, okay? Yeah, you, you bet. Great being with you, Mark. Appreciate your interest. Thank you so much. You've been listening to your first thousand clients with your host, Mitch Russo. Go to www.yourfirsttausandclients.com for a free guide on how to get a thousand of your own clients. And if you like this episode, please go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review.